Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our final IQ Academy Lunch and Learn webinar for 2018. Thank you for taking the time out to join us on our bite-sized session this month, where we will be taking a look at the aggregate industry and market perspective with Andy Sales of BDS Marketing Research. If you have any questions on today's session, you can send these through on the questions panel to the right of your screen. If we don't get a chance to cover any of these, we will ensure these are, ad are addressed in the follow-up materials after the event. We will also have a short questionnaire that will display at the end of the session today. Please take time to complete this if you have the chance, as your feedback helps us to keep the Lunch and Learn webinars relevant to your needs. Our 2019 webinar series commences in January, where we will be joined by Colin Nottage of the Influential Management Group to take us through incident investigation. To register or find out more information on this, please visit the events page on the IQ website. The address is just on the bottom of the screen now. Our branches are also running a number of events next month. Details are available on the current slide. For further information, please contact your local branch secretaries. Their contact details are available on the branches page of the IQ website. I'll now hand you over to Andy. Good afternoon, and many thanks for logging into this webinar. Appreciate everybody has a full and busy job, and so your time is much appreciated. This is the first time BDS has delivered a webinar to the Institute of Coring, although we have addressed the industry at various conferences over the years. And by way of a very quick introduction, my name is Andy Sales. I'm research director at BDS and have been for the last 13 years. Prior to this, I spent 20 years at Hanson in various management roles. BDS was formed in 1989 and has since become the leading consultancy specializing in research of the heavy building materials markets, including aggregates, asphalt, ready mix concrete, concrete products, and others. We publish annual and periodic sector reports, monitor all planning activity in relevant sectors for new developments, and provide bespoke research services for clients to support their own in-house projects. Our website provides an overview of our activities and details of all of our latest published reports. So, on with the show. The aggregates industry, a market perspective. During this webinar, we're going to look at the aggregates industry from a commercial angle. We'll, I'll illustrate the trends in how volumes have moved this century, review market performance in 2017 and for the first three quarters of 2018, discuss the major players and the industry changes since 2010. I'll introduce the impact of recycled and secondary aggregates, and look at the downstream products of importance to the aggregates industry. We'll evaluate the position of the industry longer term in relation to aggregate reserves, review the main end uses for sand and gravel and crushed rock, and go on then to identify the key challenges the industry is facing today. And finally, we'll try and gaze into the crystal ball to see how the market will change. We're looking here at the trends in demand for sand and gravel and crushed rock since the beginning of the century. The year 2000 has been used as the base year with an index of 100. And these are based on BDS figures taken from our annual report, which provides estimated outputs and market shares for every site and company summarized at county, regional and national level. For the first few years, of the century, we were looking at relatively stable markets for aggregates. This was until the banking crisis of 2008 and subsequent recession. And between 2007 to 2009, crushed rock volumes fell by around 30%. And the picture for sand and gravel was even worse, down by almost 35%. Despite a blip in 2012, when a new mini recession was feared, recovery has been pretty consistent up until 2017, when we then saw a drop in the market. And this has been fueled by Brexit fears to a large degree. At the end of 2017, demand was still down on pre-recession levels of 2007. For crushed rock, this meant they were still 17% lower. For sand and gravel, the figure was 24% lower. 
and the aggregates market as a whole remains around 18% down when compared to volumes in 2007. The gap between sand and gravel and crushed rock volumes has opened up over the last decade, as we see increasing levels of substitution of crushed rock for sand and gravel. But there are other factors. As far back as 1960, sand and gravel accounted for 67% of the aggregates market, but now crushed rock is estimated to represent the lion's share, approaching 50%. And there are a number of reasons behind this. There's been the growth of the recycled and secondary aggregate sector, substitution of sand and gravel by crushed rock, an example being that in the period 2002 to 2014, sand and gravel used in concrete declined from 71% to 63%, while the use of crushed rock in ready mix concrete production increased from 16% to 21% just in the period 2006 to 2010. There have also been changes in end use and markets for downstream products, which have different proportions of sand and gravel or concrete, uh, sorry, or of aggregates, depending on which product, product they are. The geography of supply and demand has a factor as well, from where the resources are to where the major construction projects are. But one thing the graph clearly shows is that crushed rock volumes have recovered at a much stronger rate than sand and gravel. Now this slide gives a high level view of the makeup of the total aggregates market in Great Britain in 2017. The total market was estimated to be around 255 million tonnes. Now all of these figures have been rounded to the nearest 5 million tonnes for, for ease. And the primary aggregates total of 185 million tonnes includes marine dredge material. In total, there are around 260 primary aggregates producing companies in Great Britain at the moment. There's 140 sand and gravel producing companies, 175 that extract crushed rock with a proportion having both types of operations. Now these figures are once again taken from the BDS annual report. On the right hand side, we see recycled and secondary aggregates. Now the terms of these are often used to mean the same thing, but I would argue that they are very different and there are key differences to note. Recycled aggregates are produced from the processing of inert construction, demolition and excavation waste, i.e. materials that have already been used in construction, whereas the source materials for secondary aggregates are an output from a separate industrial or manufacturing process. But I'll explain more on this a little bit later. These two maps illustrate the 10 regional markets in Great Britain and the output levels for each type of material in 2017. But please note the figures on each map were produced for a report at the beginning of this year and have since been revised and amended in our recently published annual reports. But they are still highly representative. Cross rock, we can see that two thirds of output came from quarries in the Southwest, East Midlands, and Scotland areas. Whereas on the right hand side for sand and gravel, east of England accounted for almost 25% of the total, and four others, namely Southeast, West and East Midlands, and Scotland, all had shares of between 13 to 15%. But we know that not all material is consumed within region, as some regions are exporters and others importers. Aggregates will typically travel 50 miles or more by road, and especially for higher quality stone, for example, with a high polished stone value rating. Plus, we know that up to 5% of all crushed rock is shipped into rock wharves before being, dis before being distributed to market. And around 10% of primary aggregates are transported out of region by rail. The following two slides look at how each regional market has fared in the first three quarters of 2018 when compared with market performance to the same point last year. For crushed rock, whilst eight of the regions are showing an improvement, in total there's been really only very marginal improvement and that's partly because two of the top three producing regions, namely East Midlands and Scotland, have shown contraction in demand. 
If we move on to sand and gravel, we can see a slightly different picture. The sand and gravel market overall is down slightly against last year in the first nine months. The largest market, East of England, however, is up by a couple of points. But East Midlands and Scotland, which showed weaker crushed rock volumes, are also depressed for sand and gravel. The overall picture is that the aggregates market is virtually flat compared to the same point in last year. Now, it is possible that there is still some latent demand that was built up during the first four months of 2018 when the weather was particularly poor for long stretches across all of Britain. However, we feel that most of this is likely to have been caught up by now. We're looking here now at the market shares of the leading five producers, which are in descending order, Tarmac, Aggregate Industries, Hansen, Semex, and Breeden. The others represent the remaining 255 operating companies. Now the shares of the top five combined are significant. For sand and gravel, it was estimated to be around 61% in 2017. But for crushed rock, there was a higher concentration, which we estimate to be up at around 76%. And in total for all primary aggregates, including marine dredged sand and gravel, the market share of the top five producers was around 72%. The proportion of the total market occupied by the five majors, and interestingly enough, there have been five in one form or another for many years, despite the various mergers and acquisitions, has actually changed very little since 2000, and it has been consistently around a 70% market share. And even during the recession, when the majors in particular multiple the most sites, pits and quarries, they were actually able to do so without losing much in the way of market share by diverting supply, in most cases, to a nearby site. Now, this slide illustrates the main changes in company ownership since the beginning of the decade, with 2010 on the left, running through to the current year on the right-hand side. The top row all relate to Breeden, which has been the most acquisitive of all of the companies. Just going through the top, we can see that in 2010, the creation of Breeden Group following the collapse of Enstone and renamed Breeden Group. Straight away in 2011, the company acquired CNG Concrete, followed by the next year, Speyside, Sand and Gravel. In 2013, it acquired 11 quarries from Aggregate Industries and four from Marshalls. The following year, Bar Quarries in Scotland, Huntsman Quarries in Gloucestershire, and a 50% share in HV Bowen, a Welsh operator, was also added. Breeden went quiet in 2015 before resuming in much greater style and volume in 2016 when it acquired Hope Construction Materials and also the operations of Sherburn Stone. Last year, Umside Aggregates and four quarries from Tarmac were added. And finally this year, Lagan Group, the Northern Ireland materials company, predominantly, and Blink Bonnie Quarry were added to their portfolio. A couple of other major things to talk about that are below the, uh, the date line. In 2013, there was the merger of Lafarge and Tarmac. This deal was the subject of a lengthy competition and markets authority investigation, and as a consequence, the forced disposal of a host of assets from the merged business to a newly formed company. That was called Hope Construction Materials. And then just two years later, in 2015, Lafarge and Swiss-based Holcim, the parent of Aggregate Industries, merged their global operations. But to allow the deal to go through, the Lafarge tarmac sites were split between CRH, the Irish multinational group, who renamed them and now operate in Great Britain as Tarmac, and the remainder went to Aggregate Industries. And this time, this also marked the demise of the rather short-lived Hope Construction Materials. In addition to what you can see on the slide, there have been other smaller deals resulting in changes to individual site ownership, but we couldn't put everything on the chart. We come back now to recycled and secondary aggregates, and we've already discussed the definition of these products. Between them, materials produced from recycled or secondary sources accounted for over a quarter of the estimated total tonnage of aggregates consumed in 2017. 
BDS publishes a biannual report analysing the size and composition of the recycled aggregates market in Great Britain. In the most recent, we identified around 700 individual static aggregates recycling plants operated by over 450 separate companies, including all of the major primary aggregates producers. We believe these sites are now producing in excess of 50 million tonnes per annum. But this total does not include materials that are produced and reused on construction sites or that are produced for in-house use. The secondary aggregates market is much smaller, but growing in importance. The businesses involved in their production are often specialist independent companies employing specialized and sometimes patented technology from which to process and produce aggregates. The sources of the materials used in the manufacture of secondary aggregates are chiefly China clay waste, predominantly in Cornwall and to a lesser degree in Devon. The processed secondary aggregate being sand. Energy from waste incineration produces IBA, incinerator bottom ash, and something called APCRs, air pollution control residues. Steel manufacture produces GGBS, ground granulated blast furnace slag, and electricity generation from coal-fired power stations produces PFA, pulverized fuel ash. Now this is likely to stop in 2025 when coal-fired power stations are set to close in Great Britain. Let's take a quick look at added value products, which are of significant value to aggregate suppliers as many of the leading companies are involved in one or more downstream manufacturing processes. These provide a guaranteed fixed outlet for a proportion of their production. Around 25% of aggregates goes into ready-mix concrete production, while a further 20% is used in asphalt and concrete products combined. Aggregate industries and CEMEX have interests in all five product categories to a greater or lesser degree. Hansen sold all of its building products in 2015, and these now trade under the name Forterra. Other concrete products shown in the bottom line include things like flooring, which includes beam and block and hollow core, curbs, channels, pipes, and other drainage solutions, walling, etc. And it's worth noting that 65% of the top 20 aggregates producing companies are involved in asphalt production. And this figure increases to 75% of the top 20 that are involved in the manufacture of ready mixed concrete. So we've now got a chart using the year 2000 as a base index where we've tracked the trends in outputs of aggregates against ready mixed concrete, asphalt and concrete blocks. The ready mixed concrete market is the only one showing growth since the turn of the century. You can see the gray line just appearing above 100 on the far right. But despite this, volumes are still around 10% down on the pre-recession peak of 2007. It is worth noting though, that in 2009, BDS started reporting on the mobile batching plant sector, MBP, of the ready mix market, which is more commonly known as the volumetric sector. Prior to this, volumes produced in this area were not factored into BDS estimates. And we now believe from our analysis that this has grown to represent just over 10% of the total ready mix concrete market in 2017. Now, if this sector is removed from the 27 total, the ready mix concrete market is then around 6% lower than 2000 levels and down by around 19% on pre-recession 2007. The other three products, are below the level of 2000 and 2007, with asphalt down by 10%, whereas aggregates and block deliveries are lower by almost 20% each. So now we start looking ahead rather than back, and we're looking at aggregate reserves here. Total aggregate reserves, and these are BDS estimates at the end of 2016 when we published a major analysis on this subject, were around 6.5 billion tonnes. The top five producers are thought to hold nearly 65% of the consented sand and gravel reserves, bottom right, and almost 80% of crushed rock reserves, 
bottom layer. And so based on BDS estimated outputs for 2017 for each material, the consented sand and gravel reserves would last for around 13 years, one, three years, and crush, crushed rock just under 50, five, zero years. Now, in addition, there are currently 340 million tons of consented marine sand and gravel reserves. And these are actual figures published by the Crown Estate, which manages the licenses for marine dredging. These two charts have been added to illustrate the distribution of consented aggregates, aggregates reserves across Great Britain. In turn, they also illustrate the challenge to the industry in delivering materials from their source to their destination markets. Around 75% of crushed rock reserves are located in the East Midlands, Scotland and Southwest areas. For sand and gravel in the lower chart, a similar volume of total reserves are concentrated in the South and East of England, West Midlands and Scotland. The replenishment rate is the relationship between planning consents granted for new reserves against what has been extracted in a given period. Now, all of the statistics shown here were published by the MPA, the Mineral Products Association, last month based on its members' feedback. And based on this, 2017 was a below average year when compared to the average over the last 10 years. Less than 25% of the sand and gravel extracted in 2017 was replaced by new consents. But this looks positively generous compared with crushed rock which saw the equivalent of just 3% of 2017 extraction replaced by new reserves based on the MPA data. Now BDS will be publishing our own replenishment analysis in quarter one next year, and it will be based on all planning consents over the last three years. One of the activities that BDS undertakes on an ongoing basis is the monitoring of all of the 400 plus local, county and unitary planning authorities across Great Britain. And the aim here is to identify all new applications and consents for mineral reserves. And these can be new greenfield sites or extensions to existing operations. And companies gain access to this planning data and other companies under annual subscription. Now the 10 year average for sand and gravel is 53%. And the 10 year average for crushed rock 69%. The conclusion to draw is that aggregates are being consumed faster than they're being replenished. So where is all of this material used after it has been dug out of the ground or dredged from the seabed? We've analysed this based on the main construction sectors. For sand and gravel, house building and other new work, which is comprised of commercial, industrial and public non-housing work account for nearly 75% of output. The picture is not as concentrated for crushed rock. Other new work is the largest sector, but then is followed by infrastructure, excluding roads. And this includes, amongst other areas, rail, airports, harbours, energy, water and sewerage and the like. On this slide, what I've tried to do is summarise a number of key challenges that the industry is facing, and most of which it can do little to control. BDS sits on the Mineral Products, Association, uh, Mineral Products Association Economic Affairs Committee, which meets several times a year to help construct the forecasts used by the industry. And for several years, we have seen a succession of projects slip back, and for a, for a variety of reasons and consequent delays in the demand for our industry's products. These include Hinkley Point, which is well underway now, HS2, which saw preparatory works start this summer, Crossrail, which is still seeking more funds, and a host of road schemes, which we have seen pushed back. Now, RIS is the road investment strategy, which is published by Highways England. Each RIS covers a five-year period. RIS 1 is coming to an end in 2020, and it has seen a number of delays, postponements, and scheme cancellations, but fortunately not of the A14, which is well underway. RIS 2 runs to April 2025 and includes 30 billion pounds worth of road investment in total. 
The National Infrastructure Pipeline produced by the government details the planned infrastructure and construction investment across the public and private in sectors. It holds over £460 billion pounds worth of projects expected to be delivered over the next decade. But as I said before, we've seen progress being hit seriously in recent years, so we'll watch this with interest in the coming decade. I've included Heathrow Runway 3, but this is years of consultation and planning to go through, despite being, improved, being approved in Parliament earlier this year. Planning for aggregates, well, much noise has been made in the industry relating to this this year in terms of looking to not only help speed up, but also improve the success rate of minerals planning applications. And this is vital as the industry has predicted that demand for minerals and mineral products over the next 25 years will be at least 5 billion tonnes. And 25 years is the sort of time period that government planning authorities and aggregates companies need to be planning for. The national planning policy framework is currently in revision by the government, which now recognises that minerals are essential to, pull, to support its growth plans. Now, whilst that's obvious, obvious enough to us, it wasn't something that was acknowledged in the original revision proposals by the government. And of course, the government plans now include delivering 300,000 new homes every year. Sterling is included because the strength of the pound is key to companies, especially those dependent on imports of key materials such as fuel, oil, bitumen, and others. But this is likely to be determined in no small part by the B word. I think you will know what I mean, and about which I will say no more. I have two slides now, which are taken from the forecast sections of BDS's suite of annual outputs reports. This one provides a high level view on each of the main construction sectors. The line on housing relates to changes in new starts. The other, the other areas comprise public non-housing, which includes schools and universities, hospitals, libraries, municipal offices, etc. The commercial sector covers private schemes in retail, offices, hotels, cinemas, other leisure facilities, including things like the new White Hart Lane Stadium for Tottenham. Industrial schemes cover factories and warehousing. While infrastructure has a wider net incorporating investment in roads, rail, airports, harbours, energy, which includes Hinkley Point C, water and sewage, which includes the ongoing Thames Tideway Tunnel. Now we can see that 2018 will see contraction in some areas, most notably the commercial sector. Speculative office construction has almost ceased in the southeast at the moment, and the retail sector is down. From 2019, much of the growth in construction will come from the infrastructure sector, underpinned by the schemes we've already mentioned. Now, by the early part of the next day, decade, we do expect all sectors to be returning to growth. Here we're looking at BDS forecasts for the main three products, and the comments made above feed into these forecasts. However, it is not possible to directly correlate construction industry growth with demand for aggregates and added value products. And believe me, we've tried, served the MPA and other, other companies. Different projects demand different levels of materials. A key example of this is new road construction versus a smart motorway upgrade, utilizing hard shoulder running in peak periods. There are quite a few of these planned by Highways England in the coming years, which require significant investment, but very little in the way of materials compared to a totally new road. Now, with any of these forecast figures, they come with one big, huge caveat, and that is the B word. And that concludes this webinar. I hope that you're still logged on. I hope that you're still awake and even found it interesting and worthwhile. All it now leaves me to say is thank you for your time today and best wishes to you and yours for a happy and safe festive period. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, and thank you to all of those who took the time out to join us today. As with the previous sessions, we will be making the recording of the webinar and slides available to you all for access. Keep an eye out for an email from us in January 
with the respective links. If you do have a chance, please provide your feedback of today's session on the questionnaire that will be displayed shortly. Thanks again for joining us today and don't forget to register for our upcoming webinars that are of interest. All details are available on the events page of the IQ website. Thank you.